Hi everyone, I am Lily. And I'm Shruti Jain. We're both PhD students at BMJ University and we're the hosts and producers of a relatively new podcast, Immigrants Wake America. And thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to um, talk about critical, uh, critical listening through the process of producing our own podcast. So our podcast, Immigrants Wake America, um, consists of season one, consists of eight episodes featuring storytellers who share their family histories about migration and the centrality of women in their life history, in their life stories. These storytellers have submitted stories to um, the digital archive, Your Story, Our Story of the Tenement Museum in New York, which we will uh, introduce in detail <clears throat> soon. Then most of the storytellers are born and raised in the United States. Their parents or the grandparents or great grandparents migrated to the US ages ago. Um, some of the storytellers are first generation immigrants. We conceptualized this podcast at a time of rampant increase in anti-immigrant violence. And our vision for this project is that it will act as an intervention in the dominant narrative about immigrants. Um, we conceive of the podcast as a creative response to the growing bias and violence against immigrant women as seen in the Atlanta shootings, rise in hate crime since the onset of COVID-19, the US-Mexico border crisis, and so on. Um, one of the goals of our podcast is to have the audience start to reconsider the meaning and the definition of immigrants and to think about their family's migration histories after listening to our episodes. That in turn may hopefully combat um, a certain level of anti-immigrant rhetoric. Um, these days, most of the times when people hear the word immigrant, they associate it with new immigrants with a negative connotation, um, such as undocumented, illegal, and all of those really derogatory words. But in fact, most Americans are more or less related to immigrants. Um, except of course, Native Americans. We believe that storytelling allows us to find similarities and differences between ourselves and others, thus offering a humanizing counterpart to these harmful narratives. As we just mentioned, um, our community partner is the Tenement Museum in New York, specifically its digital archive, Your Story, Our Story. So founded in 1988, the Tenement Museum focus, focuses on U.S. immigration history and, quote, celebrates the enduring uh, stories that define and strengthen what it means to be American, end quote. Its mission is to, quote, foster a society that embraces and values the role of immigration in the evolving American identity, end quote. Then your story, our story, at the Tenement Museum is a digital archive that houses stories related, uh, associated with immigration and migration. It highlights stories of immigration, migration, cultural identity, and past and present through objects, traditions, and memories. With Your Story, Our Story, the Tenement Museum invites people across the country to share their stories in the online digital storytelling exhibit. Each story reveals one individual's experience. Together, the stories help us see how the unique histories shape the nation and the patterns that bind us, um, that bind us together. After a whole year of um if we can say so ourselves, a successful season uh, producing our podcast, Immigrants Wake America. We are really grateful to be able to use this opportunity today to re-reflect on the scope, limitations, and possible expansions of a project like this with a particular focus on the form of the podcast. Um, in addition to the two mainstream forms of podcasting, one that translates academic work for public interest, and then the other that facilitates conversation across scholarly disciplines, Mark Hagood proposes a third type of podcast that allows, quote, allows scholars to use the affordances, aesthetics, and evidentiary power of sound to make arguments that are different from those found in written work, end quote. In the process of conceptualizing and production of our podcast, we respond to this particular call. 
we conceptualize our podcast as one that explores these very affordances of the medium and its engagement with stories of immigrant women recorded, unrecorded, or misrecorded in the archives. Mac Haggard also notes that um, speech or voice provides a whole set of audible formal expression, including, quote, pitch, volume, speed, timbre, and syllabic emphasis, end quote, which, quote, both expand the range of semantic and pragmatic um, possibilities and add precision to these dimensions of speech. He also adds that there are other dimensions of verbal communication to consider, for example, quote, the indexicality to place on a speaker's accent and the clues about their identity, psychology, and even body that the voice provides, end quote. So there is an um, affective dimension in the production and consumption of podcasts. The form of the podcast has drawn to our attention the fact that the sonic variations in the voices of our storytellers are not just um, characteristics of oral storytelling or the listening pro process, but are as much an essential part of the story itself. The epitomalization of racial difference and the subsequent relegating of race to a visual domain is a common phenomena. As uh, Professor Jennifer Stover reminds us in her book, um, quote, far from being visions opposite, sound frequently appears to be visuality's doppelganger in US racial history, unacknowledged but ever present in the construction of race and the performance of racial oppression. Professor Stover um, has also introduced like two con new concepts, the sonic color line and the listening ear. According to uh, Stover, quote, the listening ear drives the sonic color line. It is a figure for how dominant listening practices accrue and change over time, as well as a descriptor for how the dominant culture exerts pressure on individual listening practices to conform to the sonic color line's norms, end quote. She also argues that the sonic color line produces codes and polices racial difference through the ear, in that enabling us to hear race as well as see it. It is a socially constructed boundary that racially codes sonic phenomena such as vocal timbre, accents, and musical tones, um, <clears throat> end quote. Our podcast is an attempt to intervene in this dominant uh, listening culture in the US and global media industry. We believe that podcasts hold the potential to disrupt this flattening out of complex range of sounds that, um, that Professor Stover talks about. While the fact that these stories narrated with their sonic components can be accessed by people online, we want to shift at this juncture into the process of thinking about how these stories available in the form of the podcast also call for a particular kind of um, critical listening. In our podcast, we imagine ourselves not as hosts and producers, but facilitators who happen to have the resources to get people together in the same room or on the same virtual oral space. We thus imagine our listeners at three levels. We, of course, as facilitators, are listeners of people's stories as we undertake the process of recording and editing. At the same time, the storytellers listening to each other, finding similarities and differences in each other's stories act as the second set of listeners. Finally, the audience, the community members are our third set of listeners. We believe that in this project of producing listening, our storytellers are composers, co-composers, and co-producers of their own and each other's stories. Meanwhile, the listeners or the audience of our podcast are also co-composers of these histories that we hope work towards waking America up, so to speak, to a new kind of storytelling. The production process of the podcast is communal and democratic. To minimize our influence on the storytellers and listeners, we as facilitators 
keep our voices and interjections minimal in the recording process and final product. Also, the editing process, which can often be an individual executive decision, um, also involves the storytellers just as much as the recording process does in our podcast. We have also innovated with methods of community editing, where we edit in groups of as large as 15 people by editing based on everyone's feedback. Of the various spaces in the world where listening happens unconsciously or simultaneously to other modes of consumption, the form of the podcast enforces singular orality that then evokes other senses. Um, so in a crowded marketplace, in a metropolitan city, in a public uh, school or at a music concert, one hears various sounds. However, one opens the Spotify app with the or Apple podcast or whatever with the specific purpose of listening. Thus, as podcasters, we are answering to the call to produce sound that people consciously choose to listen to. Um, so through our podcast, we try to present a variation in tonality and accent that is hard to imagine under one sonic subset. However, we are really cautious against um, thinking of this diversity as a potential post-racial American oral order of some sort. Um, this is not an assimilative version of the liberal American dream. In fact, through micro histories that our storytellers are willing to share, we see the fault lines in the American dream that is built on and can only be made possible through a silencing of these very micro histories. These stories in their sonic and semantic variations present to us not a successful integration into the dream of America, but a waking up into an America that immigrants have constantly been building as conscripts of the global order of racial, gendered, and economic inequality. This is why we choose to call our podcast Immigrants Wake America. And at this point, we would like to play a small montage of the various um, episodes from our podcast that help us make um, this point. Um, Lur, can you stop sharing your screen? So, yeah. Thank you. These stories can help us untangle mythology about immigration, about indigenous um, you know, presence on this land, that by having a, a platform where everyone can participate, um, you really see how larger narratives um, can be more complicated. Um, when we're looking at, at the story of one person or one family and how that family has changed over time, you see how the United States has changed over time. Welcome to Immigrants Wake America. This is a podcast where storytellers share their family histories and the centrality of women in their life stories. In response to the growing hatred and hostility, we conceptualize this podcast as a space for conversations among storytellers who are very much living, breathing, and responding to the current moment in their lives. And my great grandma said, no, we came here and we're going to make it here because that's what we said, that's what we set out to do, and we're not breaking that promise. But you know, all my focus was, okay, what life is it for my daughter? Where do I take this kid to grow? I don't want her to take her to Uganda. I don't want to stay in Nigeria. Where's, where am I going to take this daughter of mine? A hot chocolate pot that's passed down from your own mother is not something that you can buy in a new country or even in a country that doesn't really have hot chocolate or she didn't even know. Yeah, it feels nice when I'm able to like speak to other people in Russia and feels a little warm and like I'm connected to them even though I don't fully agree with a lot of the values of the culture. It's like this really weird paradox where it's like, I feel so connected to you. But also, I could not, like, see a person who I'm more different from. In America, I think, like, the best part is that we're all from different places. So we're all, like, like interacting. So I think, like, as time goes on, like, you just get, like, a blended identity. But I think that's, like, what makes us who we are. Welcome back to Immigrants Wake America. This is a podcast where storytellers share their family histories and the centrality of women in their life stories. 
were all immigrants. Some people's families came, you know, in the early days of the settling of the country, but anything might inspire them as well to think about um, what their connection is to the, the land and the past. Our neighborhood was filled with people from uh, several different uh, ethnicities, from several different areas. Um, it was a, a mixed neighborhood, and it was really interesting. Um, you know, you, you found out that not everybody was the same, and uh, people spoke different languages, but we all blended. The other challenge we faced, like most of the families, actually, and I mean, the women had reached a point where maybe they don't want more children, and they said, you know, I've had enough, and they see the struggles here. I mean, when they come to America, the culture is quite different because at home they have at their home they have support. Children have someone, you know, a, a relative who will come and take care of the children for her to do other things. But here they are just on their own, you know. But the husband will not lift a, a hand. Said, you know, you know, they want more and more children. So one lady in particular, she told me that she doesn't want to have another child. If I have another child, I'm going to die. So I said, okay. So she came here with her daughter. And so we were translating through the phone, you know, and she was really serious. She really wanted, she didn't want more children. So I took her to family planning and I said, so if they give you contraceptives, what, what, how are you going to take them? Now, don't worry, I'm going to hide some of them and you can keep some of them here for me. I'll, I'll, I'll come for them. So that's how we did it. So I feel like a lot of people, uh, like a lot of children of like immigrants there there are obviously it's like this huge trope in terms of i guess like living to like parental expectations um as you know like the second generation or first i i honestly don't know and so as a kid i discovered it's through stories that we make sense of life and that we connect with others and and we grow in in second grade i went to class in a trailer and I had this young teacher named Mrs. Coffrin, never forget her, and she encouraged my love of stories. And she allowed me to put on a play by using a short bookcase as my stage and puppets as actors. And it was a catastrophe because midway I got really carried away and I accidentally knocked over the bookcase. And the class went wild, um, but she embraced me as a teacher. So that's when my path to becoming a lover of stories and becoming a professor and now arriving to your story. Our story. I think Leo, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Working now? Okay. Um, so media studies scholars use the concept of, concept of symbolic annihilation to talk of the misrepresentation or manying or um, misrepresentation of minoritized groups in popular media. Michelle Caswell has adapted the term and applied it to the absence or misrepresentation of marginalized communities in archives. She advocates the powerful um, forces of community archives encountering symbolic annihilation. In thinking, of, thinking about archives, Foucault is concerned with the density of discursive practices. Um, this wearing he observes quote, systems that establish statements as events and things, end quote. Um, <clears throat> this system of statements as events or things is what contributes to the law of what can be said. Following Caswell, we're also trying to bring to light, bring to light stories that have been marginalized, minoritized, and or silenced, and to expand the process of archiving itself. Our podcast serves as a dynamic medium to represent the stories and histories that complicate generic conventions and acts as an intervention in the ways in which immigrant women's stories and histories are narrated and passed on. <laughs> 
we already spoke about how we be truly believe that our storytellers are co-composers and our audiences are co-composers and therefore producing spaces of cr critical listening collectively. Um, we also believe that podcasts really have this um, open up a collaborative potential, um, which helps us in finding new ways to expand traditional methods of archiving to be more community driven. Um, the team of supporters we have for our podcast are actually collaborators. Humanities New York and IASH provide major funding for and a lot of support for the first season of our podcast. Dr. Lisa Yoon, um, who's a professor at English Department um, in, in Binghamton University, and Catherine Lloyd, um, the Senior Director of Programs at Tenement Museum, have been our advisors and executive producers of the podcast. We studied storytelling and its role in humanities and community engagement and learned the theories and ethics of engaged scholarship in Professor Yoon's community engagement class. Professor Stover um, and Professor Monteith McClum have taught us about the techniques and ethics of podcasting and supported us throughout this process. Other professors, staff and graduate students at Binghamton University and the American Civic Associations have contributed to various aspects of the podcast as well. As a way to expand this collaborative project, we plan to create a second season of our podcast. In the second season, in addition to featuring storytellers who have submitted their stories to the digital archive, Your Story, Our Story at the Tenement Museum, we will also collaborate with the American Civic Association to reach out to more uh, members across the local community to add to the existing archives. In addition, we also plan to have units within our project dedicated to translation, recording, editing, and creating teaching resources. Besides making the podcast, we also um, hold events. So we just held a community engaged event last week on October 12th, and we plan to conduct another one in spring 2023. At today's event, um, the community members, the interested scholars and students have an opportunity to interact and share their stories. Through these events, we aim to create a space to voice their stories and to archive more such stories in the digital archive um, at the Tenement Museum. And we aim for meaningful and engaged conversations and try to blur the boundaries between the university and the community. We hope that both our podcast and the events we organize around that help create a safe space where storytellers can share, empower each other and build effective long lasting bonds. And finally, we hope that this collective thinking through critical listening helps us all helps us all create more empowering spaces for sharing stories through podcasts. That's all for our presentation today. Thank you. We are very happy to um, talk more about critical listening and any ideas and anything that we all have to offer to how we can achieve this kind of a space. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing about your amazing work. Um, I wanted to ask a bit more about how critical listening relates to your collaboration with the Tenement Museum and more generally like museums as collaborators. Um, because I think of museums, you know, not necessarily as, as um, you know, aiming to produce critical listening, but perhaps more critical looking. Um, maybe that's a sort of um, limitation in my thinking, but I'm just curious to, to hear about your experiences working with the Tenement Museum. Um, you know, had they worked with audio? I mean, I know they've worked with audio before. Had they worked with this kind of podcast project before? And, you know, yeah, what did you learn from them? Were there any kind of points of um, divergence as well between, you know, the kind of critical listening you were aiming for and the things they wanted from the collaboration? Um, Shuli, um, I can start and then you add to it. Okay. Um, the Tenement, thank you first, thank you for your comment and question. Um, the Tenement Museum, it actually had a podcast before, but different, different type. Like their podcast uh, from before was more like um, a quote unquote American. <laughs> um, um, mm. 
uh, that hosts um, narrating the stories or introducing the stories um, um, included in the podcast instead of directly inviting the storytellers like what we are doing. Um, so, um, um, yeah, so that's that's like a little different from what we're doing now. And our podcast, um, the tenement, we are also currently working on a project um, which will be um, featured on the on the um, website of the of the tenement museum. That project will include the link to our podcast, so um, they can direct the link the stories to the podcast. Yeah, yeah, and kind of just building on what Leah said, the podcast itself is. You're right in that, like we also did not imagine the museum is specifically. Uh, intending to produce critical listening in that way um, but we were enthralled uh, about a year and a half ago when we started exploring the collection and the kinds of stories that are housed in the digital archive at the tenement museum and we started thinking about these stories and we realized that they were all in written formats of course there were also sometimes uh, sound clips attached to these stories but like Le was saying there was no um there was no forum where these storytellers were actually coming and telling these stories. One of the things that we realized that really becomes possible through the form of the podcast and trying to produce this type of critical listening is that when people start to talk, they speak about much more than what is archived in there. Um, so we also kind of started realizing, and this is something we spoke about last year at the symposium, that um, podcasts in themselves hold the potential to expand the process of archiving. How we think of archives, how we think of museums can really be expanded um, with this uh, new form that we have now. Um, so while there have not been any points of divergences, particularly with the museum, there has definitely been a sense of extension of the work that the museum is doing with their stories. I hope that answered your question. Professor Stover, would you like to um, kind of add something about the podcast or your work or generally this stuff that we are thinking about podcasts? I actually wanted to hear more about the editorial process, like more material and more granular, because I am fascinated by by the way that you have um, select, you know, the way that you've decided to to edit the work and kind of this community editing practice, which I think is is really fantastic. Yeah, Ooh, we got it. We got it. We got a cosign on the question. Awesome. <laughs> Um, should I start or should you all oh, start? Perhaps you had learned, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, of the editing process was, um, it has been fun and also, um, and also, um, time consuming. Like, we our recording are normally over an hour long, <laughs> but we have to cut it, um, between 15 to 20 minutes. So it was a, like lots of hard decisions to make, like what to, to keep and what to, um, to have to give up on. Um, so we normally, first we cut it to like about 40 minutes if Shudi started and then she sent it to me and then I cut it more and, or if I start um, the whole process and the Shudi give feedback on that one then we we just like back and forth back and forth and eventually we have a like a shorter version and then uh, in terms of the group editing um, that was a a test we did so we had a um, pre-edited um, like roughly edited episode we brought that roughly ed edited episode with us to uh, Dr. Lisa Yun's uh, community engagement class. And then with in that class, we played this, we played the clip and then we asked for everyone's um, feedback. So they, they were like 
listening really carefully. And then after that, they give us their feedback, give us like what we could improve, where we could improve. And then we took notes of all the feedback and we re-edited the, the whole episode. So the final product um, was like including everyone's feedback. Should Also, sometimes storytellers kind of also edit a little bit, like not in the sense of sitting on an editing software and edit, but um, when we send them the drafts of whatever we have edited, it's not like we're just asking for their approval. And I mean, it's also difficult to just say it like this, but in the process of recording, we've met them so many times and we've almost built a relationship with them in the sense of like the recordings we do become conversations. So like uh, the clip that in the clip that we just played, there was this storyteller who was talking about his relationship with Russian and how he feels really intimate in that language, but also he feels like he's very different from the people who speak that language. Um, at large. Uh, so I really resonated with that personally um, opinion because of the kind of things that are happening in India and the kind of language that I speak and the, that the, how that language has become the carrier for a lot of fascist ideas that are developing. Um, so there was a whole bit about how I spoke about that and then he said things. And so there is a relationship between us and the storytellers that we have ended up developing, um, which really helps us kind of tell them that we're not just asking for their approval, but their editing, basically. So we've had instances where storytellers are like, no, this doesn't sound that good. Can you do this again? Um, I don't want this bit of my story on the podcast. You know, that, that type of stuff. Sometimes they give us suggestions on music. Um, sometimes they tell us things like, uh, I think you can cut out the um and the ah uh of yeah. my voices a little bit. Um, so although this is not really like one person or a group of people sitting behind an editing software and doing it, it's the closest we have come to be able to um, really edit collectively as much as possible. And of course, your class, Professor, we played it in your class. And in your class, that was the actual big group editing process that we did, where people like noted down timings and gave suggestions. Yes, because I guess that's how I had imagined it with the the people in the podcast. So thank you for clarifying. So you kind of workshopped it with a group of people that were primed to kind of give you feedback on on it, and then you kind of do more of a one on one process with the with the co creators and the narrators. Yeah. Do you yeah. do any mixing with their voices? Has anyone like talked about the sound of their voice or um, in terms of? like the sound of it or is it mainly content feedback mainly yeah. content yeah yeah okay. right on yeah nobody's actually brought that up um at all yet yeah oh i think because sometimes i hear my voice mixed in, in <laughs> other places and i'm like that's not because like it's just a, it's a weird feeling to hear it because i know how my voice sounds recorded so it's weird to hear it on someone else's so that's do you do much I mean do you do much in terms of that like what is I know you do editing in terms of cutting down and juxtaposing and I heard there's like some orchestral music in and out um how are you building your your soundscapes like it seems like you have your own critical listening philosophy about 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 that um and then there's a question in the chat about the group feedback I didn't want to drop that and lead us a totally different direction yet but but yeah, I'm curious about the, the soundscape element. Um, well, the, the larger, I think, I don't, want, I don't know if I can say philosophy because we're really just thinking through it now, but what we've come up with- um, Ethics is a better word than philosophy or practice. <gasps> I guess yeah I mean we do want to get to a place where we can have a philosophy of um, critical listening in that way but um, we have actually done mainly content-based kind of editing um, and we really I think this is also something we spoke about before which is that the music that we've used in a lot of the places in the first season of the podcast we're kind of going back and looking at it again and um really trying to be more reflexive about how um I mean just for the lack of a better word how the music manipulates the listeners um to respond in a particular manner um so I think the big balance that we're trying to strike is between creating something that is entertaining engaging to people who don't know these stories who may not know tenement museum who may not be interested in immigrant histories da 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 
but also to not lose the authenticity of the way that the stories were told. Um, yeah, I think that's the big balance that we've been trying to strike and also finding hard to strike, to be perfectly um, honest. Yeah. I mean, and also just to kind of address the, the question in the chat box, um, it was open. It was yeah. really open. We had no questions for people. And it was kind of also like that because it was a community engagement class. So they were engaging with these ideas of community engagement already. They were reading on the ethics of this kind of a thing. So we, what we brought into the class when we spoke to them was um, praxis, I guess, of yeah. like, doing this and what it would mean to do the work that the students are reading about. Um, I guess that's what we were like trying to bring to the class. Yeah, <clears throat> before we played the, the clip, we, uh, we were saying that like, just imagine you yourselves are the editors, like what are you going to do with this like roughly um, edited clip? So yeah, then they like listened carefully and give us their feedback. I have so many more questions, uh, but I want to just make space for people who haven't asked questions yet to uh, to bring anything up if they want to. I kind of have a question. Um, I think, um, Shruti, it was, uh, you were describing this earlier and I, um, I mean, listening is so like attention in general is so weird because uh, especially I find with audio as opposed to like reading is like I, I'm, I'm a literary scholar. And so like reading is on some level easier to analyze because like just text on paper is easier to analyze because you're just dealing with like blocks of words and like each word like just means its own thing and like you can get like trippy with like the materiality of the page and like paratext and stuff like that but it's really just like a sequence of words and you're like blah, blah, blah. um and then like with audio um there's like the sound of a person's voice and uh like I don't know anything about music but um just like really adds another so like there's like another, it's just like shapes or that relationship to words differently, I think. Um, and uh, so I, I, I'm like, um, you know, two days into the symposium, which has been amazing and like kind of listening and like, it's all like, you're all new to me. And so like listening, but like, you know, also in some cases, like um, in front of the computer being like, like like getting carried away by the sound more than the meaning and then so I'm just like noticing what I do and don't pay attention to and I did notice I I because I speak Russian so I I heard when you were like um so you know like you know it's like one of these like problems of like identification where you're like is that really important? Like, it's not, like, that's really not the thing I should have, like, heard, but, like, it was um, about, uh, like, the Russian speaker who was, like, not feeling like they were um, part of, like, the, like, Russophone, <laughs> whatever, like, group, like, community population, um, and how you connected over that uh, because of your relationship to language in India and, like, the way that like I, I I don't know the politics of language in India at all but like I, I don't know that person th that you were talking to but I thought it was like I was like that's ex like that's totally how because like my response to what that person said was like what they like uh, how could they like like I like I don't get along well like what do they think about Russian like I'm not really Russian I'm Moldovan but like what do they think about Russian people like they're fine or like they're just just like some are fine some are not like they're just like people like I don't know what to tell you um but then I was like yeah like I was like oh yeah I feel like like that's kind of like a 
you know, actually, like, uh, my family likes to say that, like, the politics in Russia right now are, like, super xenophobic. And so I was like, that's kind of like that guy, that Russian person was, like, kind of making a xenophobic statement. <laughs> but, like, you know, in, in the context of, like, talking to you and who's, like, dealing with, like, another language and another, like, political framework, it came across as, like, a bridge building and, like, point of um, connection and empathy. And I guess that's what I'm really interested in with podcasts. Um both interview and narrative podcasts that kind of uh, employ a lot of the same tools as uh, like traditional narrative, like textual narrative, where at the same time that our like minds and hearts are opened by people with different experiences, it's often in this like kind of like cross cutting context of like, we are open, but like maybe what we're hearing is like a little bit and like that's my judgment of that person I guess like and I might be wrong but like um and you framed it as an opinion but which I was uh, really appreciative of or grateful for and um so like like yeah it's like what like it's like a general question for the humanities like what what are like the stakes of like acknowledging that like the stories that we hear are um are like by virtue of the fact that we can like uh, relate to them they are like showing us uh, something like possibly negative about the perspective that's like kind of uh, like uh, opening up that's yeah I don't know if you have any feedback <laughs> I mean yeah I, I I guess I fully feel you <laughs> I've um I also I'm in the English department and uh, I also don't really work fully in my dissertation with like podcasts specifically um so I'm, I've also honestly been thinking about the whole narrative thing that you were talking about um and you're right um our podcast um we kind of decided at the beginning when we started doing this that all of the storytellers on the podcast really are completely different people and obviously, obviously completely different people and have completely different ideas about things. And one of the ways in which we wanted to kind of decenter ourselves from this project as much as possible, given that we are at the end of the day editing this, we are at the end of the day producing this. So being aware of that, still trying to decenter ourselves a little bit, um, we 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 kind of agreed, Le, Le and I and Professor Yoon and everybody else in the project, we kind of agreed that whatever our politics may be about things, that doesn't have to be the politics of the 16 storytellers on the podcast so far. In fact, all of them don't have the same things to say about the world. Um, for in instance, one of our storytellers came on and um, kind of shared with us that America used to be xenophobic at a particular point in time, but it's not anymore, which is not something that we necessarily want to endorse. Um, but it's there on the podcast and it's important for us to have that opinion that we don't want to endorse on the podcast, along with the opinions that we do want to endorse, because honestly, we try not to endorse like from our end, be the endorsers, which <laughs> is a funny thing to say as we are like trying to de develop a philosophy of critical listening. Um, but that was really important to us to be able to have not just a wide variety of differing conflicting opinions in the same podcast, but also for us to be able to take a little bit from these conflicting things that people say. Um, so while I might not fully emotionally relate to the um, Russian speakers, whatever they were saying, there are parts of the, the same story that they narrated that I do relate to. Um, and I think it's finding those conflict points within this story and also conflict points between your emotional uh, makeup and that story's emotional makeup that really helps people connect, I think. And and I mean, to put it more simply, Le, Le was saying this earlier, but um, stories help, help us see similarities and differences between each other. And the clear cut goal, aim, whatever of the podcast was to be like, no, this is not how immigrant people are. Actually, they may be like this and they may be like that, <laughs> you know? So just, that was, I mean, I don't even know if I'm at this point answering your question. Um, and Le probably wants to add something to this also, but I do want to say that I remember you said when you were asking the, uh, when you were making this comment, you spoke about the materiality of the book and how that might be different in the case of Sam. And I was thinking that Professor Stover might be a brilliant person because I remember we briefly spoke about um, the materiality of sound. 
uh, right? Um, and I'm really, I haven't thought much about this, I haven't read much about this, but um, this would be a great point, Professor, for you to maybe talk about the material aspects of sound. <laughs> Sure, and I actually put a bunch of stuff in the chat. Sorry to blow that up. I was thinking about doing some research this morning and came across these new books on audio narratology for for the English English folks out there. Um, which and then a, a link to Neil Verma's great theater of the mind, which I think in our class is where we started. That he's one of the first to do a comprehensive analysis of radio aesthetics in terms of building soundscapes, building space in your work. Um, and, and that is in, in our podcasting class, we, we thought about, we thought about that, you know, in terms of sound design, really thinking about telling, telling stories that way, but then also the, the, the dangers of that, or the need to be critical when you do that. And I appreciate that you're going back and re-listening to your music and doing things like that to think about that. Cause I remember one time in our class, we had a moment where, <clears throat> Another student had been making a great podcast about um, women. It's called The Reluctant Muse, and it's about women who are artists themselves, but married to to male artists who are more famous and you know in their time. And going back and giving another critical look to it, and she had interviewed a friend um, who was writing a play. She was either writing a oh she was writing a play about a, about a woman and her family that served the purpose of a muse. But the way that part of this she had used, it was a play about um, her grandmother's experience in China. And she had used a sound from the play to set up the next speaker coming, but before the speaker had had a chance to, like she hadn't put her voice in there yet. And so using certain sounds before she spoke kind of set up this sense of, of Asian-ness and this kind of sonic kind of marker, sonic kind of color line sound that wasn't necessary. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't necessary for the story and actually really worked against what, what she was doing. So I remember we had a real critical conversation in our class, like, you know, have, have your person speak speak first, let them introduce themselves and not the sound. Um, it's important to kind of think about those those things. So really thinking about how a lot of people use certain sounds for shorthand purposes. Um, and that can be, you know, that can be to tell stories that can be work really well, or it can be also, you know, really dangerous in terms of our history of gender and race stereotyping. Um, and I love the way that you are thinking about accent in really critical ways too. That's great. Cause you know, and then I feel like you're also calling great attention to the American accent in there. It's fantastic um, what you're doing. So that is a real critical piece that, that I heard in there. Is that, is that, did, did you need me to, I'm happy to say more, more about that, but it is really important. I think actually when we teach our podcast class, we're going to rename it because we call it intro to podcasting and a lot of students, um, not you guys, but a lot of students signed up thinking it was going to be more like a chat cast or more like, um, you know, like a solo kind of, here's what I think, which is, you know, those can be great, but we were really thinking about building building narratives through through sound. So I haven't looked at those narratology books yet, but they look really good. I actually offered a course in the summer, uh, previous summer. Uh, and I, I think I call it sharing in sound. Um, and I did a bit of like um, the systematic annihilation, uh, testimonial injustice um, sort of scholarship. Uh, bringing it into storytelling and thinking about what podcasts can offer us in light of those conversations about silencing, which is mostly, you know, done, especially by literary scholars in these like written forms, we read testimonials, we go back to the archives, which is great work, of course. Um, but uh, given that we have this like boom of this new media form, I guess it's not even new anymore. But if we are awakening to it now, um, yeah, what, what the podcast can offer in the light of that scholarship, that conversation, that intervention that um, stories can make when heard and listened to, I guess. 
I know that you're doing, you mentioned doing events along with your work. Have you ever thought of doing like a live episode of your podcast um, in terms of storytelling and, you know, inviting an audience and inviting folks to share, share their stories while, while you're hosting it live? I think it could be a really great format um, for, for your work. We haven't thought about that, but thank you so much. That's a brilliant idea. We thought of um, thought of having another event um, focusing on more like collecting stories. So um, <clears throat> we work. We've been working with Professor Yun on um, having the template for for community members or the story uh, potential storytellers to share their stories. Um, but yeah, thank you, Professor Stover, for your great idea. I would totally come. That that sounds like it would be would be really would be really fun. And then you might get more people interested in doing the long form storytelling with you after after coming to that. Um, are you guys are you putting those any are you um in addition to the podcast, are you going to archive the actual the long form interviews themselves that are not already part of the Tenement Museum? That is our plan for the season two. So we are going to um, collect stories and then <clears throat> have them on the podcast and then kind of like put them to um, the Your Story, Our Story archive. We've been uh, running into like a bit of a conundrum also with that though, because the long form interview kind of thing of the podcast or the recording is also stuff that like there's stuff in there that people don't necessarily want the world to know, you know, they've kind of spoken to us uh, about that stuff. Um, I don't know. So maybe like consent forms is a good way to go probably about it. But then there's also like, it feels like a project, you know, like, <laughs> And we haven't felt like it's a project yet. So yeah, we still have to work that out. Um, can I ask a question about, um, you know, critical listening, the editing process and time? Um, because a lot of what you were saying earlier about the, the editing process was really resonating with, um, the process that um, I and my collaborators have developed in, in our podcast projects. Um, but especially, I think we um, have used this language of like fresh ears that we try to kind of like rotate who is editing and who is giving feedback so that people with the fresher ears can listen to new edits and, and kind of make decisions that way. And it sounded like that was also part of, you know, the ability to listen critically you know that you want to bring in new listeners um those groups that give you feedback um but also the, the two of you alternating like one of you cutting down to a certain length and then the other person taking it to an even shorter length anyway i just thought there's like you're doing a lot of quite thoughtful um you know using time as a tool for critical listening yeah no that's Absolutely true. I actually didn't think about it until this point that you brought it up, but it's true, you know, sometimes like I let it something and I'll, there'll be like these glaring things that I would not see in it because I've listened to it 53 times now. Um, but then Le would listen to it and she hasn't heard the recording in maybe like three weeks. Um, and so when she goes back to it, she sees, she, she hears things that I haven't and then that happens the other way around. And then we have so many other people who listen and give us feedback and really are uh, equal stakeholders in the project in that way. Yeah, a lot of time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was really wonderful for us to be able to think through um, critical listening. We, it's something we really started um, doing really recently, Le and I, we just, because we did spend the last year kind of thinking about how this is expanding the process of archiving the podcast. Um, but just to think about kind of reflecting on what we are producing in the sense of producing listening and to be able to have the space with all of you wonderful people to um, think it through was really great. Yeah. So we have one minute left and I have the responsibility of uh, ending the meeting. Um, 
So first of all, I'm going to put the form, the feedback form, the suggestions form in the chat. Um, if anything that you've heard in this conversation has sparked ideas for new projects, new collaborations, things that the Humanities Podcast Network could, um, you know, could do or that you would look like to have collaborators to work on, please use that form just to register that. Um, this is going to be the way that we really try and kind of like support projects that emerge out of this symposium. Um, and then I just wanted to thank Shruti and Le for this wonderful hour. Um, thank you all for being here um, and look forward to things that emerge out of this symposium. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I also, I also put you. in chat Shruti and Liz a, a recent article on Sounding Out about their podcast and links to posts on Sounding Out that are about kind of audio storytelling and podcasting analysis of podcasts. So those are there and available for everyone. And thank you, Shruti and Liz. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.